Welcome to Dialogue. 23 UN human rights experts recently issued a joint statement calling on the United States to act on police violence and systemic racism. What prompted the statement? How bad is racism in the United States today? And after a tumultuous few years, how will President Joe Biden heal the nation? To discuss all these issues, I'm joined by Victor Kaljukai, Chair Professor at Suzhou University, and Ray Baker, journalist and adjunct professor at Towson University. That is our topic. I'm Wang Guan. Welcome, gentlemen. Last Friday, 23 UN human rights experts released a joint statement calling on the United States to, quote, end, state, end police violence and address systemic racism. Um, let me go to you first, Ray. You've been covering race relations out of Baltimore as well as Washington, D.C. for uh, quite a few years there. Um, what's your understanding of this issue? How bad is racism currently in the United States? So racism in the United States is quite honestly a very serious problem. It is not any, it's not fair or it does not do us good analysis to say it is better or worse than in years past. What we do know though, is that we have greater access to information and we're also hearing the voices of those people in communities that have been typically oppressed. So now we're able to hear language around white supremacy, around Eurocentricity, and how that has been harmful and functionally anti-black in the United States. So today what we are seeing is a, mo a modern revelation for so many Americans and those who observe the United States across the world about what truly is the racial problem here in the United States. Well, Ray, we've just heard from, you know, the conservatives at the CPAC meeting. We heard from Mike Pompeo, Donald Trump, as well as some other figures, Ted Cruz. Um, you know, they're simply dismissing, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement as violating law and order. But uh, a month ago, during the Capitol riot, uh, they were not so quick to condemn the rioters. Is there a double standard here? Of course there's a double standard there. There is absolutely a double standard by any person who practices any functioning behavior of white supremacy. The idea that white supremacy exists will tell us that we cannot expect logic, reason, or consistency from people who would espouse such beliefs. We've heard reports here in the United States that those supporters of former President Donald Trump, those supporters of Mike Pompeo and others are the ones who will say things to the effect of the Capitol riots, as they've been called, were not actually Trump supporters. That Antifa and others had infiltrated to bring ill name and reproach to Trump supporters. But those folks are intellectually inconsistent, they are dishonest and disingenuous, and when we engage them on questions of conversation of their ideology, it's a bad faith exchange. Unfortunately, far too often, these people are not being consistent, respectful, or applying any laws of logical reason. Uh, Victor, let me go to you here. Um, how do you look at the fact that the United Nations human rights officials calling out the United States to address the issue of racism? I think the United Nations human rights experts raised a very important issue in the United States, and this issue has been in existence for hundreds of years. We know for sure that the United States had a civil war uh, to end slavery, uh, which ended in 1864. It's already more than 150 years uh, since the Civil War ended, but the racial discrimination against the Afro-Americans and other uh, ethnic minorities in the United States are deeply rooted and they are very serious today. And I think the U.S. government and the people need to demonstrate wisdom and courage to get to the root causes of racism in the United States rather than try to brush it under the carpet and pretend as if this problem is not in existence. I think the sooner the America is getting hold of this issue and address this issue, the better. I mean, last Tuesday, a New York grand jury announced their decision not to indict uh, any officer over the death of Daniel Prude, who, of course, died, unfortunately, after being restrained by police. And this happened 10 months after uh, George Floyd, another African-American uh, who unfortunately died. Um, how do you look at the fact that um, 
these uh, white police officers, you know, um, overusing their police power happening again and again in the United, in the United States? Victor. Well, Bruce, uh, well, police brutality against Afro-Americans is institutionalized in the United States. And I think lots of people have become victims of that. And at the same time, I would say many Asian Americans have also been victims of the uh, police brutality. I think the Black, Matter, Black Life Matters movement is a very important movement in the United States. It calls to attention from the global community that such bru uh, police brutality existed in the United States and need to be addressed as quickly as possible. In this context, I think the United Nations human rights experts raised the right issue at the right time because I would say America can no longer afford to turn a blind eye to the deeply and institutionalized prejudice and discrimination against Afro-Americans and other racial minorities in the United States. Well, one last question, Victor, before I go to Ray. Do you think racism is a sort of violation of human rights? Absolutely. I think uh, racial discrimination and uh, persecution of the uh, black Africans in the United States and other uh, minorities is very much depriving these people of their human rights. No human rights will be complete without due regard to everyone's rights and their due uh, process under the law and anyone who uses race or color of the skin as a benchmark against him or her is practicing such heinous crime against minorities in the United States. Well, Ray, let me go back to you. Um, talk to us really about this institutional or institutionalized racism to our global viewers. Uh, and do you believe this is a type of violation of human rights? Absolutely, it's a violation of human rights. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk to your viewers about the institutionalized racism in the United States. Something very dear to so many Americans is the Second Amendment. And it speaks, the Second Amendment speaks, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, to this right to keep and bear arms of a, in a well-regulated militia. A huge impetus for having the well-regulated militia of people to keep and bear arms was to quickly and easily amass a state-sanctioned group of people who could put down slave rebellions. So if that's baked into the fabric of the United States Constitution by being one of the second amendments to that Constitution, what we in the United States call in our Bill of Rights, that shows how fundamentally integral to the American project that racism is and was. Policing in the United States, by and large, gets its origins out of slave patrols. And it becomes a way and a mechanism to manage and protect class interests when there may be a collection of the masses who have certain particular human needs. And when they see as though they may need to take grievance with those who have the greatest access and greatest reach of capital, the police are the barriers between those folks. And functionally in the United States, African Americans and people of African descent and other ethnic minorities by and large are the ones who are at the lowest end of the socioeconomic spectrum, the lowest end of the health spectrum. And so what policing does, what policing was originated to do in the United States, and what policing unfortunately continues to do is serve the interest of wealthy white capital. And when we mean wealthy white capital, we obviously are not saying everyone in the United States is a white person with a lot of money. But it is saying that police primary function is to protect those who have money and their possessions. And the rest of us hopefully get helped along the way. But we're not the primary concern. And that's why time and again, the human rights violations we see in the United States are often black Americans. But please, I do not want your viewers to be misled. White Americans are getting killed by cops as well. Asian Americans are getting killed by cops as well. Our Latino and Latina friends are being killed by cops as well in the United States. So policing is functioning primarily in a class question, but in the United States, class and race are inseparable, and it's valuable to recognize how the two are intertwined. Well, Ray, talking about Asian Americans, uh, there has been a steady rise in hate crimes against Asians in America. 
in light of COVID and uh, presumably uh, the former president's labeling of the COVID as quote unquote China virus, which I still did uh, a day ago at CPAC. Um, many prominent Asian American actors such as Daniel Wu has been very active in speaking out against these hate crimes against Asians. Uh, you know, people who study history understand this, right? Uh, Asian Americans has been called yellow perils, uh, you know, with uh, Fu Manchu uh, literature characters portrayed to eternal foreigners. Um, that was the label given to Asian Americans. Uh, what is the plight, uh, the status of Asian Americans these days um, and their racism that they're facing in America? Ray. Our Asian American friends are right now in a very perilous place. One of the reasons our Asian American friends are in a perilous place is because the white supremacist motif of the United States does not do a good job of differentiating the various cultures, humanities, and ethnic groups that make up what we would like call Asian Americans. And so there are some specific uniqueness to folks who may find themselves of Chinese ancestry as opposed to Japanese ancestry, as opposed to South Asian ancestry, where we would think of perhaps a place like Pakistan or Bangladesh or somewhere else in that, in India perhaps. And so what we're finding are that the same sense of what we see with regard to black people, anti-black white supremacist behavior is functioning in an anti-Asian white supremacist behavior. But unfortunately, because white supremacy organized Asian Americans as the model minority in the 1960s, specifically to contrast them against black Americans who are calling for social justice, now we see there are so many white Americans as well in the United States who don't take seriously issues of racism when our Asian American friends are the ones who are victimized. And so this is unfortunately the doing, the functioning, the byproduct of the United States' commitment to white supremacy and its anti-Asian and anti-black and anti-minority bent, but the outcomes are, unfortunately, our Asian American friends are hurting, and now there needs to be a course of good human beings, regardless of their race, ethnicity, culture, or creed, who can say this must stop, and those who have done this must be held accountable. Mm -hmm. uh, Victor, talking about crimes and racism against Asian Americans, uh, do you think this has anything to do with the ongoing rivalry between Beijing and Washington, or was it more political and cultural? I would say racism, including racism against Asian Americans in the United States, is deeply rooted. It predated the current COVID-19 pandemic. However, I would say the pandemic has made this problem even worse because we see lots of reports about victimizing the uh, Asian Americans, including the Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans, Vietnamese Americans. There is a surge of such crimes against Asian Americans. Try to label them as not belonging to the community over there in the United States and try to drive them out of the United States. Now, any such racial crime against anyone is actually a crime against the whole nation of the United States. Everyone becomes a victim of that. Therefore, I think it's very urgent in the United States to do the right thing. And it's encouraging to see that President Biden at least is moving in the right direction compared with his predecessor, who really became very derelict and also incited such white supremacist movement and racism against minorities. So I hope the American people and the American government will hurry up with their job and uh, do a good and better job in this regard because America can no longer afford to see such racial discriminations against African Americans, Asian Americans continue for any longer time. You know, Victor, when I read the Western reports, they say that China is, you know, reframing the, the concept of human rights. Uh, they say China is stealing the the word of human rights by redefining it um, as rights to survive, to uh, food and safety. But if you look at the situation in the United States, you look at Texas, the power grid outage, uh, the uh, racism issues, uh, COVID-19 deaths, mm -hmm. um, there are problems, right? Absolutely. I would say uh, human rights in the United States should definitely include the right of the people not to be infected by the pandemic due to the dereliction of the government officials. And I would say, with more than half a million Americans dying from the pandemic, almost 30 million people being infected, 
I think the American people need to wake up. They need to really ask for accountability and responsibility of their government leaders, rather than, for example, uh, turn a blind eye to their complete dereliction of their duties and mislabeling the uh, situation and putting not science above everything else, but politics above science. This is a dead end, and I think American people will realize that human rights need to include the right not to be discriminated or not to be infected by the pandemic due to the dereliction of the government leaders. Right. Uh, Ray, what do you think? I, I appreciate what the guest is saying, and I, the United States is functioning at a tension point. Its founding, as Dr. Gerald Horn, of a, a historian here in the United States would tell us, comes as a settler colonial project. So all of the, not all, but much of the rhetoric in the founding documents about life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, coming very much from John Locke of Britain, talking about life, liberty, and property. Oh, the rhetoric of each man is born free with unalienable rights did not intend to extend to all the people in the United States who are now asserting and demanding their rights. So functionally, as a nation, there's a tension point. Black Americans were not included in the all men. Women were not included in the all men. Those white indentured servants were not included in the all men. And so now as more and more Americans of all walks of life, but particularly affected are those of African descent, call for and demand their human rights, demand justice, demand a government that accounts for them, that aids them, that protects them, that serves them, we're finding a tension point because the United States was not constructed to do those things for those people. Margaret Kimberly, a writer here in the United States, talks at depth about what failed the folks in Texas was less of a problem regarding electricity, but a capitulation to oligarchs. Capitalism and humanity are functionally incompatible, and time and again, the United States chooses capitalism and the humanity suffers, and we are all left to look at the United States and ask meaningful questions about the inconsistency in the rhetoric of all men are created equal, that we all deserve life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, yet the function and the existence that so many of us live through here in the United States on a day-to-day -day basis. All right, Ray, thanks so much, and uh, we'll take a short break, and our program continues after the break. All right, welcome back, gentlemen, uh, Victor and Ray. Um, welcome back to Dialogue. Ray, let me continue with you. The COVID-19 death toll in the United States, unfortunately, has passed the half million mark. Half a million Americans died. Think about it. That matches the toll of three wars the World War II, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War. With about 4% of the global population, the U.S. has recorded nearly 20% of all COVID-19 deaths. Uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci said that there are political divisions that were responsible for this current round of deaths in the United States. Uh, Ray, what are your thoughts? Unfortunately, so many United States, so many people in the United States either one, didn't believe that the coronavirus was a serious and deadly virus that could mean meaningful harm to so many others, two, didn't understand the way that their actions or behaviors would affect other people, and three, and this is the disappointing part when we want to think about the best in our fellow human beings, folks simply did not care. Too many Americans were going about and engaging their lives in ways that were going to be harmful to so many other Americans, but they did not care so long as they were not inconvenienced. We remember in 2020, there was a plot by some in the United States state of Michigan to kidnap the governor of Michigan because she had stay at home restrictions put in place in order to ensure the common safety and welfare of all of the residents of that state. And the response was to kidnap her. There was a report that came out in a, pro, a newspaper of record in the United States, the Washington Post, that talked about specifically white Americans saying, when you see who it is that is getting sick and dying, it's not us. So this isn't that big of a deal. 
That was a quote that someone was comfortable giving to a reporter, speaking specifically because black Americans and our Hispanic Americans are far too often overrepresented in COVID-19 deaths in the United States. Why? Because they are more often essential and wage workers who do not have the capacity to work from home, who must be exposed to other human beings in order to do their work because they're on the bottom end of the economic sphere. And so, the, excuse me, the bottom end of the economic ladder. And so when you make the, the allusion to, is this a question of political differences, we use that word political as all encompassing, but by and large, it is a societal difference. It is a philosophical difference. It is an ideological difference because there are some human beings in the United States that are so concerned with individualism that it, per, it ends up being a harm to the greater and larger community. Yeah, yeah, Ray, thanks for highlighting those issues for us, brother. Um, Victor, let me go back to you. Russia Today, uh, RT, recently says, and I quote, that for a nation that manages a global military and war machine, such, as, such failures are appalling, referring to the Texas power outage. But the two factors are hardly coincidental. This kind of mismanagement in America is not a new thing at all. It is, in fact, an integral aspect of its political and social system where the free market is religiously put before the public good and the commitment to arms and bombs is greater than to ordinary people. Your thoughts? I would say the whole world and mankind at large are shocked and appalled by the two miserable failures in the United States. Uh, first of all, the handling of the pandemic, and secondly, the uh, uh, power shortage and a lot of disasters in Texas in the middle of the uh, winter. Now, I would say for the United States, which is generally claimed as the only surviving superpower in the world, they should have done better. Their leaders should have known better, and their organizations and mobilization capacities should operate it better. But no, the situation is just the opposite. And this reveals a lot of problems in the United States. And I don't think anyone in the United States should take great pride in such failures, they should be humbled by such failures, and they should really reflect on why such failures happened in the United States, and whether they could happen again, and whether the people in the United States will suffer as uh, consequences of such government failures. And I would say the United States should also redefine what they really believe in. For example, human rights. I don't think human rights, the Americans love so much, should include uh, any tolerance of such failures at the top level of the government, refusing to put science first, refusing to care for the fundamental interests of the American people in Texas or in the whole country at large, for example. And I think it is high time because otherwise mankind and people in many other countries will really lose confidence in the United States, which has been generally claimed as the shining light on the top of the mountain. How can a shining light become so miserably dark and casting so much shadow, not only in America, but in the whole world as a whole? Right. Ray, in an article written by human rights activist Margaret Kimberly, that you just quoted, the article was titled, No Human Rights in Texas. Um, Margaret wrote that the people of Texas suffer unnecessarily from bad weather because their state puts oligarchs first and does not recognize the human right to health and safety. And Kimberly also quoted China's foreign ministry spokesperson, Hua Chunying, as saying that not to be wanting for food or clothing, not to be hungry or cold are the fundamental human rights that are the most real and tangible. Um, how do you look at that? I think that Ms. Kimberly is a remarkable writer who's been very, very prescient on a number of issues. I think this is a larger conversation around what ideology is most valuable to mankind and womankind? What ideology serves humanity the best? Putting profit as our primary goal or our primary thing to accomplish does not serve the welfare of humanity. This, I, we've had examples time and again throughout the United States of how that actually works in a harmful way. And we should not be doing that. Unfortunately, 
it, the United States, if it were to be a religious nation, it would not be Christian, would not be Muslim or Jewish. It would be capitalist. The religion of the United States is capitalism. And if that capitalism means someone goes hungry, the United States is okay with that. If that capitalism means someone goes cold, the United States is okay with that. If that capitalism unfortunately means that a 12-year-old boy freezes to death in Texas, the United States is okay with that. And unfortunately, time and again, at the peril of so many other human beings, as your guest said, the shining city on a hill doesn't shine all that bright, except for the very few who are exceptionally wealthy and the very many of us who struggle to survive. Yeah, that's really unfortunate. Um, Victor, um, finally, the United States is now announcing its intention to return to the Human Rights uh, Council at the United Nations as an active observer and to compete for a seat this fall. Anthony Blinken, the new Secretary of State, said the, the new President Joe Biden has instructed the State Department to, quote, re-engage immediately and robustly with the Human Rights Council. How do you interpret President Biden's desire to return to the council after you know, it was abandoned uh, by the former president? Well, first of all, I would say it's a good thing that uh, the United States government under President Joe Biden is deciding to return to the Human Rights Council. Uh, on the other hand, I would urge the U.S. government, including President Biden, to really think very carefully that the United States should not behave like a spoiled kid, uh, bailing out of an international organization at will, for example, the United States should really behave as an adult and as the only remaining superpower, as we sometimes call it, uh, in the world with a lot of responsibilities and heavy responsibilities on its shoulder. The world can no longer afford a United States bailing out one international organization after another as if it doesn't care about coexistence with all the other countries in the world. It is high time for the United States to grow up and mature up and behave as what all the people in the world would expect the United States to behave, as a major country with huge responsibilities. All right, thank you so much, Victor, for your insight. I also want to thank uh, Ray Baker, journalist and adjunct professor at Towson University, joining us uh, this morning for him in Baltimore, outside uh, Washington, D.C. Thank you both so very much. Thank you fascinating discussion. And that will do it for this edition of Dialogue. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. Thank you so much for watching.